are with us. Okay. Buenos dias y buenas tardes a todos nuestros participantes. Es un placer que se unan nosotros ahí para el evento paralelo Carigio. Okay, that's all my Spanish you'll get today. Uh, a pleasant good afternoon and good day to, er to everyone. My name is Cecile Blake and I'm a member of the statistics division in the unit responsible for global geospatial information management. And you'll see in my background, United Group of Experts on Geographical Names, that we're also responsible for that intergovernmental body. And of course, I'm promoting them because we are having a session from the th 3rd to the 7th of uh, May, and you're all invited to attend. So today I'll be your moderator on the Caribbean Geospatial Development Initiative event, part of the Statistical Conference of the Americas ECLAC uh, series of side events. And for the next one and a one hour and 15 minutes, we hope to share knowledge and create awareness about CARI Geo. And of course, at the end, we hope that you'll become so excited that you'll be stimulated and that you'll want to participate in this initiative. Our agenda is very packed today. We have opening remarks that will be delivered by Paloma Meridio, who is president of UNGJ Americas. And then of course, my director who I'm pleased to introduce will be speaking and then we'll have a number of other presentations and hopefully time will allow us to have open discussions at the end and our colleague Rolando will provide closing remarks. Uh, in terms of meeting guidelines, of course, you know, I have to share with you some etiquettes that we need to uh, recognize. We're kindly asking you to remember to mute, mute your microphones during the presentations. And during open discussions, please use the raise the hand button and we'll acknowledge you to speak. We ask that you, of course, can also post your questions in the chat. We'll be collecting them and we'll have them answered by our panelists at the end of the presentations. We're also noting that presentations will be made in the native language of the speaker and that their PowerPoint slides will be in the opposing language. So we're actually using both Spanish and English today. And uh, because we have a packed agenda, we're kindly asking our presenters to speak within that 10 minute time frame that you have been allocated. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask Paloma Meridio, president of UNGJ America. She wears a number of hats. She's vice president of INEGI with huge responsibility. And she also wears a number of hats on a number of UNGJ and global committees. Over you to you, Paloma. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cecile, and good uh, afternoon to everyone. I'm really pleased to be here uh, uh, in, in this side event of the Statistical Commission of the Americas. Uh, today, uh, it's a relevant event for us. Uh, we want to welcome everyone, uh, all of the um, statistical and geospatial authorities from the Caribbean region that are joining us and all the interested organization that want, organizations that want to participate in this initiative uh, for the development of geospatial information in, in the Caribbean which we call uh, CARIGEO. Uh, this CARIGEO initiative is, is looking to empower the countries and territories of, of the Caribbean uh, to advance in the use and share of geospatial and statistical information uh, for uh, decision-making in the region and for sustainable development. This uh, CARIGEO initiative builds on a previous project that was uh, supported by the Mexican government uh, in association with uh, the Association of the Caribbean States uh, and uh, the West Indies University that, that uh, was developed from uh, 2014 to 2018. And, and this new CARIGEO initiative tries to bring together all of, of the other global initiatives that are happening uh, in the UNGGIM world, such as um, the IGIF, 
the GSGF, the Ungegen Resolution about geographical names that uh, Cecile was mentioning before, also uh, the framework for uh, disasters, and all of that, all of those uh, other frameworks that are being implemented uh, at the global level, we're, we're working to really implementing them in, in the region. So Carigio is aligned uh, to all of these global uh, initiatives, but also to some regional um, developments. And, and this is why uh, Carigio is embedded in the uh, Huascalientes Declaration that was signed last year between UNGGIM Americas, Amerigio, uh, and other organizations of the region that are very interested in participating. So we want to make this as inclusive as possible and uh, also an initiative where we can coordinate, align, and, and try not to duplicate work in the region to make it uh, more, more uh, stronger and with more emphasis. So through um, this event today with the national statistical offices and, all, uh, and also other uh, agencies, uh, geospatial agencies that are joining, uh, we want to promote and take Carigio to action uh, to really uh, build conscious about the importance of geospatial and statistical information use, their related technologies, and also uh, in the development of the policies that need to be taken in order to implement these technologies for better decision making. So I really want to thank the presence of Stefan Schreinfest, the director of the UN Statistical Division. He will he has guided us in this work. He, uh, I mean, you have always supported the, this work, Stefan. So we're very glad that you could make the time to join us and to be present in this event. I, I also want to thank Michelle Sinclair uh, from the steering committee of CARIGEO, who is uh, one of our champions and leaders in the region. And she will talk about the activities, the ongoing activities of CARIGEO and next steps. Uh, to our host, Rolando Ocampo from the Statistics Division of ECLAC and also Alvaro Monet. Uh, they serve as our uh, technical secretaries of CARIGEO and they're always pushing our work forward. So uh, I want to uh, thank all of you and all the organizers, members of CARIGEO. I, I need to say that CARIGEO is one of the more active um, initiatives in the region. They meet weekly and they're always uh, trying to advance uh, in next steps and next workshops and things that are going to be. So I don't want to take more time because we have today a very rich agenda uh, with uh, a lot of uh, relevance in terms of all of the indicators that are going on in terms of uh, uh, global warming and, and others uh, that NOAA is also working uh, in terms of Sargasso uh, in the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. We will see also the example of Cuba uh, for the implementation of geospatial uh, statistical information for sustainable development. So uh, I don't want to uh, take more time. I thank you all for being here and, and, and welcome. Thank you, Paloma, for your warm welcoming remarks and for giving us a quick shot of what is on the agenda for today. Without further ado, because time is of importance, we're going to invite my director, Mr. Schweinfest, to deliver his presentation on the integration of geospatial and statistical information, the value proposition. Over to you, Mr. Schweinfest. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile, and hello, everybody. It's so wonderful to connect to you. I'm a bit far away. I'm actually in Germany at home, but I didn't want to miss this opportunity because, I mean, there are so many elements here on the table that I'm excited about this Caribbean Geospatial Development Initiative. It's a group of countries working together. It is geospatial and statistics integration. We are reaching out beyond government sector and, and talking about private, public-private partnerships. And so there's so many elements of what we have been working out at the United Nations for so many years. So I'm really pleased to make a, a short presentation here at the beginning and, and ensure you of our full uh, support from the UN Statistics Division, of course, together always with our friends and, and brothers in the region. And Rolando is sitting right there uh, uh, from the CEPAL Statistics uh, uh, Division. 
I mean, we are talking primarily to statisticians because it's a side event to the statistical conference. But I mean, the key topic is really the integration of geospatial and statistical uh, information and i think what we really we are serving big policy agendas at um, at the horizon and i mean for us at the united nations is of course the 2030 sustainable development agenda and that a development agenda by its nature is an integrated development agenda it basically says everything is related to everything we have the three pillars of social environment and economic and in order to support our job as statisticians or data manager or information managers is to support an integrated development agenda with integrated information systems. And one of the biggest integrations that I've had the pleasure of working on for the last decade now is uh, uh, the one between statistical information numbers, as we all know them, and geospatial information. We've been running the global uh, committee on uh, global geospatial information management, the GGIM, a wonderful new acronym for which we are also responsible. And I, actually, I should, we should have changed our name long ago. Instead of calling ourselves just the United Nations Statistics Division, we should have called, we should be calling ourselves really United Nations statistics and geospatial information division because this is exactly what we are working on so what does it mean uh, to integrate um, geospatial and statistical informa uh, information as i said there is the policy agenda the 2030 uh, uh, agenda for sustainable development, but it's not limited to that. We have a number of uh, policy agendas. We have also, of course, climate change. Uh, the Samoa pathway, for instance, is a United Nations policy agenda, which is focusing particularly on the SIDS. And I highlight this here because we are talking about the Caribbean context. And we know that in this current COVID crisis, the Caribbean has been particularly hard hit. Uh, it was, by all uh, standards, already a vulnerable uh, region of the world. But I mean, with, uh, for instance, the dramatic decrease in tourism as one of the major incomes for the region, this situation has, of course, been even aggravated. And, and I mean, the region is particularly uh, hard hit. And we as statisticians have been doubly hard hit because, I mean, it's almost a, a perfect storm because the demand for good data went through the roof. Everybody wanted to have information, but our classical tools of information collection have been hampered. So because our what we used to do, censuses, surveys, and so uh, are, are not what we can do. So we have to be innovative in our data uh, sources. We have to use big data. And I'm very happy to share with you that just this afternoon, uh, I signed an agreement with uh, the IBG of Brazil on a regional data hub for Super big data. Morning. And uh, this is also uh, very important in this context. But the most important thing is the integration of statistical and geospatial information. And I have, of course, the pleasure of having fought to do the tough act of following Paloma, which is always almost impossible to do. Um, and she represents, of course, the Mexican tradition of fully integrating institutionally uh, geospatial and statistical information. And I wanted to share one personal experience when it really hit me how geography is the integrating platform for the statistical information that we are used to produce was when I saw many years ago a, a, a slide and it was a single slide that is stuck in my mind of the impact of a hurricane in Mexico. And there was the path of the hurricane was, was represented in uh, the geograph in a, in a map. And because the INEGI had full integration of statistical and uh, geospatial information, it had basically geocoded all of the features that it was collecting information on. The INEGI was in a position to talk about the human toll of uh, this particular hurricane and its path, the economic toll, because they knew exactly which establishments, which production factors and factories were uh, affected. The social toll, because what was the social infrastructure that was impacted? What were the schools or the hospitals that were in the way of this particular hurricane? 
um, the environmental toll, which was the environmental, the ecosystems that were destroyed in this path. So I think that was really the moment when I understood that a map, the geography is the platform, the unifying, the integrating uh, uh, tool that brings all of this uh, statistical information systems that we know so well as statisticians, economic, social statistics, demography, and environmental statistics, which are this, the three, four big pillars that we usually work with, that they are brought together. And this work has been made much more systematic. Of course, we in the United Nations, we have a committee for everything. And we had an expert committee that was working on something that we call the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework. And in the UN, we always in, uh, invent an acronym for everything. So you better remember the GSGF, the Global Statistical Geospatial Framework. And that is the result of a lot of very intelligent people from both communities working together for quite a number of years um, to uh, define a framework that is really um, fully integrated for statistical and geospatial information. And it is built on five guiding principles. First, the use of fundamental geospatial infrastructure and geocoding. Geocoding statistical information is, of course, at the heart of everything. Geocoded unit record data and data management environment. The third is common geographies for the dissemination of statistics. Fourth is interoperable data and metadata standards, what we are very familiar with in the statistical community. And five, of course, accessible and usable geospatially enabled statistics and key elements. So everybody has seen visualization of statistics in maps, but that's only the tail end. That is only making it visual. I think a good fully integrated global statistical geospatial framework starts at the very beginning when the information, the micro information is collected and is already geocoded. And I think this framework can be very helpful. Uh, and we have gone further than, and especially in the Americas, um, we have a translation into Spanish, we have an e-learning platform to promote the framework. And um, so I would uh, very much encourage you to have a look and study it and see to what extent this could be helpful for you. Now, what's the value proposition of integrating statistics and geospatial information? I mean, first of all, there is a clear benefit if experts from different domains work together and combine information from different domains in uh, resulting in more complete and better quality information systems. I mean, one simple example is something that we have all seen in the COVID crisis. Those, we did not just get numbers, we got maps because the geospatial information and dimension was relevant. We did not just get the numbers of infected persons, but we got an exact distribution, so a full integration of geospatial and statistical information. When different experts work together, we also dramatically reduce the danger of giving diverging answers from different communities, and we avoid wasting money by collecting the same information several times. And uh, if we develop jointly comparable uh, methodologies and common methodologies and standards and harmonize data, then we can actually benefit from each other's work and do not have to reinvent the wheel. So these are just a number of reasons why geospatial and statistic in integration of geospatial and statistical information is so critically important. And uh, that's the topic of the value proposition. So what do we have to do moving forwards? There are a couple of things that we have to do. And I encourage all of you perhaps to take away from this presentation and from this meeting. And you will see some exciting national examples and ex concrete experiences. I think one big takeaway is increased communication between all sectors and all levels of government data producers. The second one is a better communication and a better partnership and exchange between data 
producers and data users so that we have a better understanding of what exactly is needed when and in which form. And of course, we have to, in order to get to that point, we have to uh, start with knowledge exchange and capacity building that is best done to concrete actions and projects. And that's why I find this CARI Geo, Geo program so exciting because it gives the opportunity to create specific programs and projects for different countries to move this integration forward. So I really wanted to thank everybody for this and for, my, for this opportunity for me to address you and share some more general introductory thoughts with you. And I really applaud the Curry Geo initiative in particular for its collaborative approach that it brings together government, the private sector and academia and civil society in an initiative to jointly better manage information for the benefit of uh, development policy, in particular for those countries that need it most the developing countries and the SIDS, just as many of the Caribbeans are. So thank you for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the event. Okay, thank you very much, my director, uh, for your presentation on the integration and importance, the value proposition of integrating geospatial and statistical information. And I will invite our participants, of course, that you can applaud Mr. Schweinfest by using your emoji of clapping hands in terms of your reaction button to acknowledge his participation. So please go ahead and acknowledge him. Thank you very much. Then we'll move on to our next presenter. Of course, she's Michelle, a colleague of mine from the Caribbean and the lovely island of Barbados. She works as a land surveyor in the Land and Surveys Department of Barbados and quite an active member of the CARI Geo Steering Team. And Michelle, without further ado, I'm inviting you to let us know about CARI Geo and what CARI Geo is doing. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Cecile. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle Sinclair, as Cecile introduced me. I'm very happy to be here. I am a focal point for Barbados at UNGJM, and I can testify firsthand on how the experience of the Caribbean project really brought Barbados forward in terms of what we can do with geospatial information and to work on integrating st statistical information to make sure we can um, move our island and our region forward. I'm going to share my screen now. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, Michelle, we're seeing your screen. Okay, Please great. All right, thank you. So the purpose of uh, Carrie Geo is for the Caribbean territories and states to improve the use of geospatial information for our decision-making, to strengthen our national spatial data infrastructures and to support the integration of statistical and geospatial information. Uh, we aim in CARIGEO to propel the Caribbean forward and to bridge that geospatial divide by seeking to empower our countries uh, to advance the use of geospatial information. And as uh, Mr. Schweins said, as small island developing states, geospatial information and technology gives us the ability to understand what is happening where and how best to deploy our limited res resources to make sure we have a uh, maximum impact and maximum benefit. We want to help as many people as we can. So CARIGEO as an initiative was spearheaded by the UNG UNGGIM Americas Regional Group and UN at CLAC. And it is a collaborative effort with not only uh, UN agencies, but as well as uh, academic uh, institutions, the private sector, countries, and regional organizations. And the hope is that we will 
integrate participant, participants from both the mapping organizations and the statistical organizations to make sure that we uh, fully look at data and data for the region. So with Carigio, the aim and the future we want is a community of spatial data producers and users that has formed and remains active. Uh, we want to make sure that we improve our capacities in the region and that we seek funding to help us support the work and the projects that we want to do. We are critically aware of the need for our fundamental data sets and data, especially in this time, as we saw in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we saw that data and being able to display data, get data out to the public was a means of, of informing people that was so critical for us in the region as well. Uh, we want to make sure that in making our policy uh, formulations and our decisions that we take advantage of geospatial information. And something that we, we definitely know we need to improve is our legislation and our policies to be able to support and make sure that we make best use of the information, as well as making sure that we collaborate. As a region, we know that together, we can achieve far more than when we try to do it separately on our own. So as uh, Paloma mentioned, uh, we are building on a past initiative, the Gains of the Caribbean Project, which sought to promote uh, geospatial and spatial data infrastructures in the region. I must say that in terms of the successes and the of this initiative, um, through technical cooperation, we've been able to have an improved geodetic uh, network in the region, which is critical to underpinning data collection. We had several uh, capacity building workshops on uh, items from geospatial standards to geodetic equipment to geoportals. And also critical was our active participation at things like the, the UN sessions in New York and being able to come and make our voices heard and to, to lobby on behalf of the Caribbean as to what we need and how we can also help uh, as a globe give our perspective. So at the close of the session of the Caribbean project, there was a, a, a realization that we had to keep it going and we had to make sure we did not regress. So we worked uh, on creating a project steering committee of which I am a member. We have members from both the UN system, from national governments, from academia. And we've been working to uh, develop terms of reference. We've prepared a program proposal. And so now we are at a stage of engaging our partners, engaging donors and making sure that we formulate uh, projects that are gonna be meaningful especially in this time. So with respect to uh, international agreements, we are ever mindful of, of international practices and CARIGEO has been designed to operate under guiding principles, which align to the UNGJM's statement of shared guiding principles. So we, we want to make sure that there's transparency, adherence to law. Um, we want to make sure that there's standards of service. And then we also sought to make sure that the internationally accepted frameworks, especially the uh, global statistical geospatial framework was something that we adopted into the work that we were doing. So we want to make sure it is fit for purpose for what the Caribbean needs. So with respect to our program of work and our, our scope, we want to be able to look at um, an assessment of where we are. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Are you seeing the, um, the scroll on the screen? Yes, I'm not, I'm not sure why that has happened. Let me see if I can clear it. I don't want to hold us back by stopping to, to to start back. Uh, one second, sorry. With regard to the statisticians. Okay. Okay, we resume service. These things happen, sorry. So with respect to the, as I said, the program of work, 
We are also interested in governance um, and policies. We want to be able to have strategic support, organizational structure, of course, um, central to that is collaboration and partnership, as well as data sets and tools. Because as I said, we know the importance, the value of data and the value of tools and reaching, reaching persons. So in the time since, uh, what, what are our now next steps? We want to be able to obtain funding support. We want to seek to make sure that we have the members of the region, make sure we have the right participants, make sure they're engaged, they want to be engaged. And we are looking now at project implementation and making sure we develop mechanisms for capacity and for sustainability. And one key activity that we've, we've engaged in is the Caribbean Geoportal. This has provided a, a open mapping community to provide data for the Caribbean region and for tools and to make sure that those are readily available to, to members of the Caribbean region. And as we were talking before about, about uh, tools and reaching people, we can see um, the Caribbean Geoportal, this is um, a dashboard from Belize taken from the Caribbean Geoportal. They've been able to use the data and to be able to display to other countries what they're doing, how they're engaging people. And we can see the value of visualizing public data for citizen engagement and for public awareness. So in terms of moving forward in 2021, we are set to have a series of webinars to engage the community, the Caribbean community, all are welcome to, to attend and to join with us. The first one is on using the geo portal, being able to make sure people know how to use it. Uh, another one that would be of great interest to you would be the integration of statistics and geospatial information. And as those webinar dates and those, that information becomes available, we will be sure to share it with the community because we want your insight. We want to work together. So just as, as a plug or an ad. We'd love to see you join us the 21st of April. It's a Wednesday and to join us for this uh, geo, uh, geo portal webinar. Again, I want to thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me. Thank you for engaging us and uh, I look forward to your questions. Okay, Michelle, thank you very much. And of course, I'm inviting our participants to applaud Michelle with using your clap emoji thank you very much so after michelle the clap emoji is at the bottom of the screen and uh, you will see it there we are now have uh, two speakers we'll have miss pauline leonard she's the officer from the division of program and planning operations in the statistics division of ECLAC, and we'll have another presentation within our 10 minute slot by Laurie Ray Elaine Franklin, who is Chief of Angular's Statistics Department. Without any further ado, I'm going to invite uh, both persons, Pauline to start, which will be followed by Laurie Ray. And I'm reminding participants, I know you have questions. Please do write your questions in the chat and we hope to have them answered at the end. Thank you very much. Over to you, Pauline. Thank you so much, um, Cecile. Um, as uh, Alvaro requested, I will now switch to Spanish, but you have the presentation in, in English. Um, entonces voy a presentar un nuevo proyecto eh, que estamos implementando desde la División de Estadísticas de la CEPAL y también desde eh, la sede para el Caribe de la CEPAL que está basada en eh, Port of Spain. Entonces es un proyecto eh, que está... Déjeme ver si puedo pasar a la siguiente... Eh, es un proyecto cuyo objetivo es mejorar las capacidades de los Estados miembros del Caribe no hispanófono eh, relacionado con la medición del cambio climático y eh, la reducción del riesgo de desastres, en particular para mejorar eh, los reportes y la implementación a la Agenda 2030 para el Desarrollo Sostenible, pero también el Samoa Pathway, eh, el Acuerdo de Sendai para la reducción de riesgo de desastres y eh, también el Acuerdo de París. 
los resultados que nosotros esperamos con este proyecto son capacidades nacionales, ya sea estadísticas y también interinstitucionales mejoradas, eh, reforzadas, para a la vez producir eh, nuevas estadísticas relacionadas con cambio climático y desastres, pero también para diseminar esta información. Y otro resultado muy vinculado es la mejora de, la, de las capacidades de los países del Caribe, eh, en particular de los países del CARICOM, eh, para usar estos indicadores en eh, la formulación, la implementación y el seguimiento de políticas públicas nacionales eh, de desarrollo sostenible que estén relacionadas con cambio climático y desastres. Entonces, el el plazo que tenemos para este proyecto es del 2021 al 2023. Eh, la estrategia del proyecto es a la vez tener actividades nacionales, pero también eh, actividades regionales y proveer eh, apoyo estadístico especializado para identificar cuál es la situación a nivel de país de la información estadística y ahí viene también nuestra colaboración con el CARIGEO porque también se va a mirar cuál es la disponibilidad de información geoespacial para producir indicadores eh, y mapas, como decía Estefan, eh, sobre cambio climático y desastres. También vamos a eh, trabajar en eh, refuerzo de capacidades que esté adaptado de forma sostenible en el tiempo, en particular eh, con eh, capacity building que esté eh, ajustado a las necesidades de cada, de cada país y la idea es que este proceso de capacidades eh, sea eh, alargado en el tiempo, sea sostenido en el tiempo a través de eh, herramientas eh, online que sabemos que con la pandemia son eh, muy importantes. Eh, básicamente las, las herramientas que vamos a usar eh, es una metodología de capacitación que eh, llevamos desde la CEPAL implementando unos 20 años en materia de estadísticas eh, ambientales, eh, que hemos trabajado muchísimo, por ejemplo, con, con México, que está aquí presente en esta, en esta metodología, ya sea de asistencia técnica en temas particulares, ya sea eh, registros administrativos o, por ejemplo, eh, algunas temáticas particulares como eh, agua y cambio climático o eh, desastres. También eh, la, el uso de eh, herramientas eh, regionales, como lo son repositorios donde están to toda la información que es necesaria para los países, las recomendaciones internacionales estadísticas al respecto y también una eh, red regional de estadísticas ambientales que le podría servir mucho también eh, al Caribe porque ha sido muy útil para fomentar cooperación sur-sur y diálogo eh, entre colegas, diálogo técnico entre las, las personas. Obviamente también eh, tenemos mucha, mucha experiencia en lo que es eh, talleres de capacitación donde se crean se trabaja con datos reales de los países y se crean eh, nuevos indicadores que están prioritarios para el país según su identificación de disponibilidad de datos. También hemos eh, usado mucho en el pasado, nos ha servido mucho eh, todos los webinars, lo mismo que estaba eh, contando eh, Michelle ahora, de hecho tenemos eh, la idea con, con los colegas del Carigeo de organizar webinars webinars conjuntos sobre eh, esta temática. Como lo dije antes, un curso eh, online eh, que permita que nuevos colegas que se integren a esta temática de estadísticas de cambio climático y desastres en el Caribe puedan capacitarse. Eh, sabemos que es muy importante y también obviamente eh, acciones de seguimiento eh, en los países con eh, mucha experticia eh, local. Así que básicamente estas son las eh, los métodos de implementación y aquí tienen los eh, actores de, de, estos, eh, de este proyecto. Las, nuestras contrapartes nacionales son evidentemente los institutos nacionales de estadísticas, pero también las autoridades a cargo de desastres y también las autoridades a cargo de eh, cambio climático en algunos países, muchas veces el ministerio de eh, ambiente. Sin embargo, sabemos perfectamente que el tema de cambio climático y el tema de desastres son eh, muy transversales. Así que nuestros eh, actores privilegiados, si bien van a ser estos tres que acabo de mencionar, la idea es que en las actividades a nivel nacional se puedan, eh, pa puedan participar muchos más actores, ya sea 
otros ministerios, por ejemplo, a cargo de pesca, océanos, eh, bosques, universidades, centros de, de investigación y organizaciones de la sociedad civil que tienen mucho que contribuir en todo lo que se refiere a eh, biodiversidad, por ejemplo, o océanos, y también el sector privado que tiene también muchísimo que contribuir en todo lo que es la información sobre el impacto eh, y la prevención de los desastres. A nivel de eh, socios estratégicos, evidentemente dentro del sistema de Naciones Unidas eh, estamos eh, haciendo un, un sociazgo muy importante con eh, UNFCCC para todo lo que es el reporte al Acuerdo de París, nuestros colegas de eh, UNDRR, UNEP también, aquí está UNGGIM Americas y también otras eh, organizaciones regionales como es el CIDIMA, el Five Seas, eh, la Organización Caribeña sobre Eficiencia Energética o OLADE, que es también la Organización Latinoamericana y Caribeña sobre Energía. La idea, como he dicho, es a la vez tener actividades nacionales y eh, regionales. Y para eh, acabar, eh, entonces les he dicho que la agencia que estamos implementando este proyecto somos eh, la CEPAL, eh, pero que tenemos como socios estratégicos eh, UNSD, eh, y también el Secretariado del CARICOM y estamos haciendo un partenariado estratégico también con la eh, OECS, en particular la Dirección de eh, Ambiente. So thank you so much, Cecile, for, uh, for the time, and uh, I remain available for any question you might have about the, the project and how we're going to collaborate with um, Carrie Jill. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pauline. We're going to move immediately to Lori Ray. Lori Ray, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. You're good. Muchas gracias. Uno momento. While Lori gets ready, I'm inviting our other speakers to follow. Please, we are running out of time. I'm asking you to be as brief as is possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Lori. Uh, thank you, Cecile. I want to take this opportunity. Good day, everyone, to thank the organizers for inviting me to make this presentation, to share and to participate in this afternoon's discussion on the approach that Angola takes in relation to the generation and management of disaster related statistics uh, for the SDGs. This is going to be a little tricky for me because I still have to look at my English slides. It is truly a pleasure to share with you and my colleagues in the development of the approach we use, which may become best practices for you in your country and you tailor them to your specific circumstances. Anguilla works closely with CARICOM, the OECS and the ECCB in relation to the generation of statistics and more specifically with CARICOM in the generation of environmental statistics of which climate and disaster are thematic areas. The presentation is as outlined. And I'll just give you a short overview of Anguilla. It's a tiny dot just above St. Martin, not on St. Martin, but just above St. Martin. And it is a country, a British overseas territory and to the very north of the Leeward Islands to the east of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. So for us, disaster statistics and environmental statistics are extremely important because we sit at the top of the belt every year between June and October when those hurricanes come along. So for us, environmental statistics and disaster statistics really came to the fore in 2017 when Irma hit us greatly. So as a department, Our mandate or our mission is to produce relevant statistics of high quality 
for both the private sector and the public sector of Anguilla and any other interesting parties who are making decisions. And we aim to do this by having a vision of where we want to be and to continue to work on our vision. The disaster statistics framework seeks to use data coming from various thematic areas, depending on the part of the disaster that we are looking at here. Is it before the disaster, during or after? So the data that is required to review these areas come from a number of areas or a number of thematic areas, I may say. If, for example, I may explain data on population comes from the thematic area, the domain of social demographic and social data. Data on GDP would come from the domain relating to economic data. So it is necessary given as we go further to use the approach which requires collaboration. The climate change and disaster statistics cross over a number of frameworks. These frameworks include the system of national accounts, the framework for the development of environmental statistics and the disaster statistics framework. As I said earlier, the domains or the areas from which we get the data fall into a number of domains. The SDG and Sendai framework is, there are a number of SDGs, 10 or 11, if I'm not sure, to, to be not too sure on it, 10 or 11 of them, that disaster risk reduction cuts across. By such, it is clearly suggesting that it is core to any SDG strategy or that in any attempt to achieve the SDGs, the collection and collation of quality data on disaster and environment has to be paramount because if 11 out of 17 focus must really be on those, the area of disaster and environment statistics. So coming out of Irma, we knew our disaster and environmental statistics were not up to par. So we had to start looking at that specifically and we joined with a project with the World Bank and the EU to strengthen our statistics in that area. We took advantage of that. So we, we are aware now of the synergies that relate to disaster statistics and the SDGs more upfront. And what coming out of that, my thoughts on the area are that as with any other set of statistics or any other set of targets set by the international forums, we need to as statisticians look closely at the synergies Lori, I think your screen has frozen and we have lost you. Alvaro, do, is there any way to get in touch with Lorian? Lori Ray? Yeah, I, I will write to her internally. Okay, uh, given that we are, is she back?
Okay, in the meantime, given that Lori is offline, I'm going to take the opportunity to invite Dr. Joaquim Trinanez to speak to us. He'll be talking about uh, an issue that's causing quite a bit of problems economically, environmentally to the Caribbean region and something that we'll all like to have addressed. Without further ado, I'm going to invite Dr. Tunanes to share with us what he has been doing. Thank you. Thank you. Eh, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Joaquín Triñanes. Eh, trabajo como responsable de operaciones del Nodo del Caribe y Golfo de México de Coastwatch y también como responsable de operaciones del Nodo del Atlántico de Ocean Watch. Este es un programa que está dirigido eh, por la oficina NESDIS, encargada de los satélites de NOAA, en la que participan también el Laboratorio del Atlántico, eh, el Laboratorio Oceanográfico y Meteorológico del Atlántico de NOAA, que está localizado en, en Miami. Bueno, eh, el objetivo fundamental de este programa es de proveer eh, series de tiempo y datos en tiempo real procedentes en su mayor parte de satélites, pero que también pueden proceder de eh, modelos o incluso eh, datos de campo. Eh, NOAA tiene una, participa una participación muy visible en, en muchos de los ciclos de vida, de las fases del ciclo de vida de los, de los datos, desde de la, la recolección de los mismos, pensemos en, en programas como eh, los, las boyas derivantes, Argo, XBT, eh, eh, Gliders hasta eh, la eh, generación de reportes a partir de, de esos datos. Pasados por todas las etapas intermedias, incluso pues, dejamos de hablar aquí de la, de la parte de eh, archivado y eh, generación de eh, conjuntos consolidados de datos. Centraré mi presentación en, en el sargazo, pero es, es uno más de los diferentes eh, tipos de datos geoespaciales con los que trabajamos. Hoy en día eh, nosotros todos los días procesamos ingentes cantidades de datos procedentes de, de satélites, procedentes eh, de modelos, eh, procedentes de, 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 de sensores eh, in situ eh, situados en, en la costa y en, y en el océano y eh, pues, eh, a partir de, de, de esos datos pues, generamos campos como por ejemplo Seascapes que nos dan información sobre la geografía oceánica o eh, mapas de riesgo para enfermedades infecciosas, etc. E incluso algunos de estos mapas de riesgo son utilizados por las Naciones Unidas, por la FAO, eh, por los centros de eh, prevención de, y control de, de enfermedades, etc. Centrémonos entonces en, en la parte del, del sargazo. sargazo es un, es un, bueno, el, el sargazo pelágico es un alga flotante que normalmente tiene una buena prensa en el sentido de que es un hábitat para muchas especies marinas, pero que en grandes cantidades pues, está causando muchos problemas en el Caribe y en el Golfo de México. Sobre todo a partir del año 2000, 2011, donde grandes cantidades de, de sargazo llegaron por primera vez a, a la, al Caribe y causaron grandes daños y están causando grandes daños porque ese, ese fenómeno se ha vuelto recurrente en eh, múltiples sectores, no solamente ecosistema, eh, dado que afecta a los corales, afecta a, a, a la fauna marina, sino también en el sector turístico, en el sector de transporte marítimo, en el sector de la pesca, etc. Entonces, el, nuestro objetivo es desarrollar herramientas que nos permitan monitorizar y seguir el, el sargazo, eh, desarrollar modelos de trayectorias que nos permitan prever cuándo ese sargazo puede llegar a, a una zona determinada o, una vez que ha llegado, saber de dónde ha venido y eh, realizar esto dentro de un entorno operacional, de tal forma que los usuarios puedan tener información actualizada de la presencia de sargazo en el, en el área. Todo esto empezó, eh, un esfuerzo que empezó eh, por nuestra parte cuando eh, lo de la, el, la gran mancha de petróleo en el Golfo de México en 2010 de The Water Horizon. Eh, uno de los aspectos eh, que desde el punto de vista del procesado de satélite eh, novedoso trajo este, este incidente fue que normalmente las zonas de, que eran reflexión especular del sol eran zonas que se despreciaban siempre como datos contaminados pero que sin embargo se vio que eran muy buenos para detectar eh, la mancha de petróleo entonces otros sensores como los, los radares de apertura sintética también proveían datos sobre la presencia de petróleo en la superficie marina pero había una serie de manchas eh, que parecían petróleo, pero que realmente correspondían a sargazo. Entonces desarrollamos técnicas para eliminar 
esas zonas como falsos positivos de la imagen. Sin pensar que eso podía ser de interés, simplemente queríamos eliminar áreas que no correspondían a petróleo. Eh, entonces, en, en esa zona eh, que tenía eh, una llegada recurrente de sargazo, pues entonces ese producto pasó a ser un producto valioso en el sentido de que podía darnos una información acerca del volumen y la, eh, pues, la distribución espacial de este alga. Entonces, en la actualidad nosotros estamos utilizando datos de múltiples satélites a diferentes resoluciones, kil kilométrica, por ejemplo, la imagen que tenemos a la izquierda, de 300 metros, la imagen que tenemos en el centro, o a, incluso a 20 metros, la imagen que tenemos a, a, mano, a mano derecha, y distribuimos estos datos en tiempo casi real. Pero también estamos interesados en generar series temporales que nos permitan ver pues, la variabilidad y la tendencia en pues, el volumen de sargazo que llega a una zona determinada. Asimismo, generamos productos de valor añadido, utilizando, por ejemplo, técnicas que nos permiten estimar la densidad del sargazo en una zona determinada. Hemos eh, desarrollado lo que denominamos SIR, eh, los eh, reportes de inundación de sargazo, que nos dan un riesgo de que una zona determinada pueda tener eh, una llegada masiva de este, de este alga. El, el algoritmo que, que, que gobierna la generación de estos reportes ha sido publicado hace dos tres semanas por el Journal of, eh, de Oceanografía Operacional. <coughs> También eh, estamos, eh, hemos desarrollado y estamos utilizando visualizadores interoperables, visualizadores que permiten a los usuarios trabajar con diferentes capas de información. Superpon superponer, por ejemplo, sobre un campo raster, un campo vectorial, generar eh, estadísticas eh, al vuelo a partir de unos ficheros con datos determinados, con datos y metadatos, porque los metadatos son extremadamente importantes en este caso también. Eh, estamos desarrollando indicadores, estamos desarrollando sistemas de monitorización, de vigilancia de eventos extremos en zonas marítimas, en marinas protegidas. Entonces, eh, este, este entorno que engloba tanto visualizadores como sistemas de distribución de datos, como pueden ser threads, como puede ser eh, AirDAP, que ha sido desarrollado dentro del, dentro del entorno de NOAA, y que permite a los usuarios acceder a los datos en múltiples formatos, es decir, y, y además de una forma automática, es decir, no necesitamos eh, bajarnos los datos eh, accediendo a un clic, simplemente desde el entorno en el que estamos trabajando, que puede ser MATLAB, que puede ser eh, Argis, por ejemplo, eh, podemos eh, bajarnos, incluir, en, eh, embeber dentro de ese entorno todos esos datos que nosotros estamos distribuyendo. La interoperabilidad aquí es fundamental, sobre todo porque permite la comunicación máquina a máquina, sin que nosotros nos preocupemos del formato en el cual se guardan esos datos. Entonces, la imagen que estamos viendo aquí es una imagen a 300 metros que muestra, que muestra unas líneas, esas líneas en colores cálidos, que corresponden a la llegada de sargazo a la zona del, del Caribe. Ahí tenemos un, un zoom, una, una, una ampliación sobre eh, una de estas, de estas imágenes. Eh, también nos interesa validar esos datos. Para ello necesitamos datos de campo. Entonces estamos participando en iniciativas de ciencia ciudadana que nos permiten incluir dentro de nuestras bases de datos eh, múltiples fuentes eh, eh, procedentes de usuarios, de personas que contribuyen con, con sus datos y con, tu, con sus imágenes de tal forma que nosotros podamos validar aquellos campos que estamos produciendo. Eh, entonces tenemos una base de datos centralizada que básicamente in, eh, ingiere datos de diferentes bases de, bases de datos, de diferentes esfuerzos de, de ciencia ciudadana para eh, obtener datos de campo y que nos permiten a nosotros pues, validar esos campos que nosotros hemos obtenido. Al mismo tiempo estamos desarrollando experimentos de modelado de trayectorias, no solamente para sargazos, sino también para otro tipo de objetos flotantes, pero eh, nos permite conocer el, el efecto que las corrientes y, y los vientos tienen sobre las trayectorias de un, de, de un determinado objeto en función de su eh, eh, flotabilidad, en función de su tamaño, eh, de su peso, etcétera. Eso también ha sido publicado y ahí tienen las, las referencias. Estoy yendo bastante rápido, eh, ya casi terminando. Esto, eh, nuestro, nuestro trabajo se alinea, se alinea muy bien con las, eh, con las líneas estratégicas de NOAA referidas a, a nuevas tecnologías y que incluye inteligencia artificial. Nosotros estamos desarrollando técnicas para, para el uso de aprendizaje automático eh, y para eh, eh, determinar zonas eh, de, de sargazo, eh, así como su, su volumen. Eh, también estamos participando en iniciativas de, para sistemas no tripulados, relacionados con gliders, relacionados con sea gliders, relacionados 
con eh, sistemas de sensorización eh, que no, eh, eh, no tripulados eh, y que forman parte también de nuestro ecosistema y que los usuarios pueden incluir también dentro de los sistemas de visualización y de descarga de datos. Estamos haciendo la migración de nuestras bases de datos a la nube, estamos integrando genómica dentro de, por ejemplo, modelos de transmisión de enfermedades que están muy relacionados, por ejemplo, en el caso de enfermedades relacionadas con la batería vibrio, con el medio ambiente, la, la, las condiciones eh, medioambientales. Eh, estamos eh, integrados también con, con diferentes diferentes esfuerzos que, que están relacionados con, con la ciencia de datos. y Entonces intentamos in, in beber todo ello, eh, aprovecharnos de las sinergias de todos estos sistemas para mejorar eh, los productos integrando datos de diferente naturaleza. No solamente diferentes sensores, diferentes resoluciones, diferentes resoluciones temporales, sino también datos vectoriales, datos a raster, datos in situ. Entonces, lo que estamos haciendo en la actualidad es mejorar nuestro modelo de inundaciones. Es eh, una mejora eh, muy visible, sería mejorando también el, 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 el modelado de las, de las trayectorias de, de, de sargazo en este, en este caso. Queremos mejorar lo que es la cobertura de, en la zona costera. Eh, ese es un, un campo muy, muy complicado, sobre todo por la contaminación procedente de mm, aguas que tienen otras sustancias, además de sargazo. Entonces, eh, queremos tener una buena representación de los vientos, de las corrientes, de las olas en esa franja costera y así eh, también estamos trabajando en el, en, en, en el desarrollo de un modelo de crecimiento de, de sargazo que sea, que sea lo más fiable posible. Y eh, para ello estamos colaborando tanto a nivel local eh, como regional con, las, con diferentes agencias eh, que nos permiten, pues, eh, de alguna forma, eh, eh, expandir, eh, dar a conocer nuestros productos, pero al mismo tiempo disponer de usuarios que nos permitan validarlos. Eh, y aquí termino mi presentación. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Joaquín. Thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, uh, of course, you can use your emoji to acknowledge and to thank Dr. Tunanes from Coastal Watch Caribbean for his presentation. Uh, time is up on us. We are running quite behind and we've missed uh, uh, Lori Ray. I don't think she has returned back online. And uh, the organizers have asked me to let you know that the presentations will be shared as is usually the case and they'll be uploaded on both ECLAC's website and also on UNG Jam America's website. So you will have access to them. And of course, I think The session is also being recorded, so you will have access to the recording. So I'm going to our next presenter, one I or two. Returned. Should I? Okay. Should I just finish or you would like to proceed? Uh, Paulina will give you two minutes to say something very quickly, because I know you were excited to be participating. So if you can, I'll allow you two minutes, uh, Laurie Ray. Please go ahead, thanks. Okay. Apologies, it was uh, a technical problem beyond my control. The internet fell out. I just wanted to complete, I'll wrap up quickly what, what I, The, the main point I wanted to make was the fact that when we have initiatives such as the SDGs, as a statistical organization, we rely on our foundations and our structures to produce the data as opposed to designing a new approach to produce the, the data for the initiative. So with the SDGs, and the disaster, we saw it fit to build a system or a structure that would allow us to provide the disaster data, which then would allow us to monitor the SDGs. I, I'm going to wrap up clearly, quickly here. The collection and management of a country's official statistics is enshrined in law under the statistics acts of the countries. Therefore, coordination to achieve maximum outputs and outcomes for the country is necessary. And with this, we took a multi-organizational approach where we allowed 
where we call together a number of stakeholders from various organizations, including the, what we call our physical planning, who would be responsible for the GIS. And it is hoped that as we go forward, we would continue to engage multi-stakeholders in the collection of the data and the verification of the data as well for better product to the respondents and the persons using the data. So I want to end there. It's a kind of truncated presentation, but we are behind time. If there are any questions, maybe I'll, I'll respond to them based on what I had to present. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay, Laurie Ray, thank you so very much for coming back online and sharing your very important points that you wanted to do with us. We'll be having, uh, I know that one or two or Gracie or our colleague from Cuba, his hair is online, but we'll be showing a video presentation. So over to you, Alvaro, please run his video. Thank you. Estimados colegas, agradezco la invitación a participar en esta reunión y la oportunidad de dirigirme a ustedes. Pido disculpas por realizar esta presentación mediante un video debido a que el uso de la plataforma Zoom está prohibida para nuestro país por la aplicación del bloqueo de los Estados Unidos. No obstante, sobreponiéndonos a esta limitación, les presento el tema Información Espacial y Geoestadística para apoyar las estrategias de desarrollo sostenible y prioridades nacionales, con el propósito de mostrar algunos de los avances alcanzados por la aplicación de las experiencias y conocimientos adquiridos durante nuestra participación en las actividades y proyectos desarrollados por ONG América. En 1995 se creó el Servicio Hidrográfico y Geodésico de la República de Cuba, integrado por la Oficina Nacional de Hidrografía y Geodesia, encargada de ejercer las funciones de representación y ejecución estatal del servicio y el Grupo Empresarial Geocuba, que lleva a cabo las actividades de producción, investigación y desarrollo para la prestación de los servicios y comercialización de los productos hidrográficos. Estas entidades tienen representación en todas las provincias del país y cuentan con aproximadamente 5.000 efectivos. Durante los últimos 10 años, nos concentramos en el mantenimiento y desarrollo del sistema geodésico de referencia, que sirvió de base para la creación del Sistema Cartográfico Nacional, con cubrimiento de todo el país en las escalas desde 1 en 25 mil hasta 1 en 1 millón y de los asentamientos poblacionales en las escalas desde 1 en 500 a 1 en 10 mil. Se creó también la cartografía náutica de puertos, bahías y vías navegables en todo el mar territorial, así como las áreas internacionales de responsabilidad por acuerdos internacionales. Comenzamos a transitar por los cambios tecnológicos y de paradigma que significó migrar de la cartografía analógica a la gestión de la información espacial en plataformas web, pasando por la creación y uso de los sistemas de información geográfica para gestión de recursos y la toma de decisiones con el empleo de información geográfica como evidencia. En 2005, y con la participación de todas las instituciones del Estado, amparado en el Acuerdo 5535 del Consejo de Ministros, se crea la Comisión Nacional de la Infraestructura de Datos Espaciales de la República de Cuba para establecer y definir las políticas, tecnologías, estándares y recursos humanos necesarios para el uso compartido de la información geográfica. Entre 2005 y 2015 transitamos por varias etapas importantes. La aprobación en 2011 del Decreto Ley 281 para el profesionamiento del marco jurídico y la incorporación de nuestro país en 2014 al Comité de Expertos de las Naciones Unidas para la Gestión de la Información Espacial y su segmento en las Américas. La IDER se convirtió en un programa dentro de la política de informatización de la sociedad, integrándose a otros programas como el de gobierno, en línea, comercio electrónico, agroalimentario, ciudadano, entre otros, que le permitió compatibilizar sus intereses al desarrollo de la nación. Se creó el portal de IDER que reunía la información espacial disponible en ese momento, con visibilidad en Internet desde cualquier lugar del mundo y se sirvió de plataforma para la realización de importantes proyectos que tuvieron un impacto positivo en la gestión de la información geoespacial desde las instituciones del Estado 
y las estructuras de gobierno. Entre los de mayor impacto está el del sistema de control de flotas móvil web, que se mantiene activo y controla en tiempo real y de manera diferida más de 30.000 medios de transporte aportando un importante ahorro de combustible. También está el sistema de búsqueda de direcciones postales, los servicios de almacenamiento y gestión de imágenes satélites y mapas topográficos en formato rastro. Se creó la plataforma Tocororo para el empleo de datos estadísticos y referenciados y la creación de mapas temáticos, los mapas callejeros de las principales ciudades, los sistemas de cálculo de ruta para la gestión del transporte y el atlas demográfico de Cuba como resultado del Censo de Población y Vivienda de 2021. Se desarrollaron proyectos para establecer los servicios de catálogo de líder, el diccionario de nombres geográficos, con la elaboración de los mapas toponímicos de todas las provincias y aplicaciones específicas como el sistema de información geográfica de aprovechamiento de recursos hidráulicos y de gestión de indicadores del Centro de Inmunología Molecular. Para comenzar el profesionamiento a la gestión de datos espaciales, se realizó un diagnóstico que identificó como obstáculos más importantes la obsolescencia operacional, la falta de ordenamiento, la existencia de múltiples formatos y soportes, la necesidad de crear un Centro Nacional de Datos Espaciales y la insuficiente normativa técnica. Con estos resultados y la visión de la necesidad de empleo integrado de la información estadística y espacial para elevar la calidad de los datos y la capacidad de gestión de gobierno, se definieron las directivas para el perfeccionamiento. Estas directivas están dirigidas a lograr un salto tecnológico en la gestión de la información espacial y aplicar el conocimiento y la experiencia adquirida durante nuestra participación en las actividades de ONG en América. Se diseñó un modelo básico de interacción de los servicios basado en estándares y especificaciones internacionales para gestionar disímiles formatos de datos espaciales. Como resultado de todo este trabajo se creó, gestionado por GeoCuba, el Centro de Información Espacial para servir a todas las aplicaciones de gestión de la información espacial en interés de las instituciones del Estado, los órganos de gobierno y el ciudadano. Se accede a aplicaciones para la visualización de información geoespacial de todo el territorio nacional a cualquier escala, los servicios de geolocalización en cualquier asentamiento poblacional y la creación de mapas temáticos. Soportada la información almacenada en este centro y gestionada en esta plataforma, se ha avanzado en el desarrollo de un grupo de aplicaciones de infraestructura de datos espaciales orientadas a la gestión de las entidades asociadas a objetivos, programas y proyectos de interés del desarrollo sostenible y las prioridades nacionales. Esta es la IDE gestionada por el Ministerio de la Agricultura para la gestión de la producción agrícola dirigida a lograr la seguridad alimentaria. Contiene información estadística y de características de los cultivos y parcelas dedicados a la producción de alimentos. Permite además incrementar la eficiencia en la gestión de la maquinaria agrícola y se vincula con otro programa priorizado que desarrolla la agricultura de precisión. Otra de gran importancia es la del Grupo Empresarial Ascubo, que desarrolla la actividad agroindustrial para la producción de azúcar. En esta aplicación se manejan los terrenos dedicados a la producción de caña de azúcar, su cosecha, el traslado hacia los ingenios por las vías más eficientes y su procesamiento en la industria para la producción de azúcar y sus derivados. Como uno de los avances más importantes presentamos la idea de la tarea vida para la evaluación del efecto del cambio climático los pronósticos de afectación y el diseño de las acciones para la mitigación de sus efectos y la adaptación a las condiciones que se manifiesten. Se muestra el pronóstico de inundación en zonas bajas de la costa norte de la zona central del país por incremento del nivel medio del mar debido al deshielo por incremento de las temperaturas medias anuales. Esta lámina muestra la vista de la infraestructura espacial del Centro de Catastro Nacional empleado para la gestión de uso y tenencia de la tierra, el uso de suelo y muebles, así como la gestión de planificación física y el desarrollo urbano. Vean además ejemplos de infraestructura de datos espaciales para la gestión de gobierno a nivel provincial. Le presento la de la provincia de Temisa, que cuenta con visores de mapas, sistemas de geolocalización, gestión de recursos y aplicaciones para la creación de mapas con información de estadística y el portal de la IDE de la provincia de Villa Clara montando una vista del mapa callejero de la ciudad de Santa Clara. Finalmente quiero mostrar algunos resultados del proyecto para la creación de la cartografía censal 
para el Censo de Población y Viviendas a desarrollarse en 2022. Se está actualizando, creando, entre otros, los mapas y planos maestros de cada una de las unidades de investigación censal. Estimados colegas, finalmente podemos concluir que nos falta mucho camino por recorrer, pero que sobreponiendo las limitaciones que nos imprime el bloqueo estadounidense y con la solidaridad y colaboración de todos nuestros amigos, seguiremos avanzando en el uso de la información espacial y estadística en interés de apoyar las estrategias de desarrollo sostenible y las prioridades nacionales. Muchas gracias. Okay, thanks to all our presenters. Thank you, one or two, Garcia. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rolando to give deliver our closing remarks. I do regret that time is up on us and we will not be able to have a discussion session. However, should you still have questions, please do post them in the chat. And I'm sure Alvaro and the other organizers will find a way to answer your questions, or of course, you would could also engage our presenters outside this forum. So thank you all, thank our presenters. And of course, I'm going to ask Rolando, our colleague in Chile, to do the formal closing remarks. Go ahead, please, Rolando. Thank you very much, Cecil. And thank you, uh, and I would like to thank all of you for participating and contributing to this relevant meeting and make a special acknowledgement. And I would like to make a special acknowledgement to our speakers for sharing high level messages, knowledge, and experience. First, let me thank uh, my dear friend, Stefan Schweinfeld, and, and um, uh, my friend, Michelle Sinclair from Barbados. Uh, um, Many years since I haven't seen her, uh, Pauline Leonard uh, from my division, Lori Ray, Aline Franklin, Dr. Triñanes, and Dr. Juan Antonio Garcia. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, also, I want to thank Paloma Merodio for her valuable opening remarks and the permanent support of UNGGIM Americas to the geospatial development in the region. And of course, uh, my dear, dear friend Cecil Blank and her wonderful uh, moderation in the entire session and her continuous support uh, over these years for uh, UNGGIM and for the Caribbean in particular. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to congratulate the current year initiative and the work carried out uh, uh, by the steering group during this last year, having uh, meetings Monday by Monday to plan activities, look for partners, elaborate projects, proposals, and organize dissemination events. Thank you very much to all of this excellent team. I would also like to, to thank the support and contribution of our dear colleagues from ECLA, Porto Spain office, who are, the, uh, who are actively engaged with the Courage Your Steering Group and, and, um, and the colleagues uh, from all the Caribbean. At the moment of organizing this webinar as a side event of the 20th meeting of the Executive Committee of the Statistical Conference of the Americas, we envisioned an opportunity to disseminate this relevant initiative to the statistical community, but also to invite and encourage the national statistical offices of the Caribbean region to actively join and be part of CARIGEO. Since the data ecosystem for sustainable development called the collaborative work between the earth observation, your special information and the statistical information communities, I'm very happy that the discussion of the CARIGEO initiative has been landed here today. There is a big momentum continuing from the global discussions and the proposed frameworks like the IGIF, the Global Statistical and Geospatial Framework that uh, was mentioned by Stefan and Paloma, the framework of land administration and the strategic framework on disasters that can support the work of Carigio. Let's leverage as much as we can this valuable reference and recommendation for this project. 
Finally, I would like to highlight the need of engaging new partners and potential donors to move the current geo initiative forward. The, the encounter of public, pri uh, private, and academic stakeholders will be crucial to advance. And here I would like to thank the participation and the presence of, of my dear uh, friend, uh, Jose Antonio Mejia from the, uh, the Inter American uh, Development Bank, and uh, my colleagues, Greg Scott and Jihei Tio from the Global UNGGIM uh, um, program. And, and, and with their support, we, uh, I'm sure that we can have uh, some um, process to, to find donors and uh, in, the, in the private and the academic uh, uh, sectors. And from the economic formation from ECLEC, let me tell you that we are fully committed with Carigio and, and we are very pleased to have you all here today and we'll, we'll continue working hard to achieve along with you the overall Carigio uh, vision to increase resilience to the strengthening of the special information management to support decision making in favor of disaster risk reduction and action for climate change and economic and sustainable development. And with this, I would like to thank all of you uh, for this uh, present. And, and I want to thank and close the session and, and have a very uh, good afternoon. And, and let's go back to the, uh, to the statistics conference, to the executive committee, and let's go back to, and continue the process of this uh, project. Many thanks. Thank you. And bye bye. See you soon. Okay. One, I'll ask one more favor of everyone, please. If you could all turn on your cameras, we'd like to capture your pictures that we can use to be posted on our website. So, all persons, would you be kind enough and we'll ask Alvaro to take the picture? Uh, can you all turn on your phones? One last request from me. We still have a number of persons that we need to have you turn on your cameras, please. Alvaro, please let us know when you're ready so we can put on our picture faces. Uh, we are almost done. I think that we have a couple of colleagues more, but okay. Okay, you're ready. You have already taken us, Alvaro? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much for participating. Of course, you can use your thank you emoji and you can go back to your other sessions. We look forward to your participation in Carigio. Bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye, Linda. Bye. -bye, Linda. bye.